from our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. More developments today on an Alabama issue that has become arguably the top news story in the whole country. State lawmakers are wanting to move quickly to enact legislation that would protect in vitro fertilization clinics from lawsuits in the wake of a consequential Alabama Supreme Court ruling a little more than a week ago. Let's get caught up on exactly where we are. On February 16th, the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos could be considered children under Alabama law. The ruling stemmed from a lawsuit in which frozen embryos were damaged or destroyed at a fertility clinic through negligence. Under a state law from the 1980s, families have standing to sue for wrongful death if a child is killed through negligence. In 2018, the legislature passed and the voters ratified a constitutional amendment, making it the policy of the state to protect the lives of the unborn. That, the court ruled, requires that frozen embryos be considered children for the purposes of that wrongful death law. That led to fertility clinics throughout the state, including UAB health systems, pausing their IVF services as they weigh the risks of being sued as a result of the ruling. State lawmakers last week began drafting legislation to address the issue and protect the clinics under state law. And by Friday, several prominent national Republican figures, including former President Donald Trump, were urging the, the legislature to act quickly. Today, House Democrats held a news conference to promote a bill they say will fix the, the, the issue. Capitol Journal was there. Coupled with efforts to erode reproductive freedom, our failure to expand Medicaid addressed the shortage of doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers, and support rural hospitals is taking a devastating toll. The reality is reproductive health and maternity health are deeply connected and that these issues require our immediate attention. The point here is that an embryo cannot develop into a child until it's implanted into a woman's uterus. Also, an embryo can be frozen and stored, unlike a living human. That's why there's so much alarm over the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling and its impact on women, their families, and IVF healthcare providers. I'm going to speak with House Minority Leader Anthony Daniels in more detail later in the show. We should also note that Republican leaders, from Governor Kay Ivey to House Speaker Nathaniel Ledbetter, have said that addressing this IVF issue is a priority, so we, we expect to hear more in the coming days. A scary situation over the weekend around the Capitol complex. An explosive device was found outside the Attorney General's office building. That's the white government building southwest of the Capitol. Attorney General Steve Marshall said in a statement that the device was found on Saturday and detonated. Marshall said, quote, thankfully no staff or personnel were injured by the explosion. The Alabama Law Enforcement Agency will be, the leading, in, will be leading the investigation and we are urging anyone with information to contact them immediately, end quote. To report any information to Aaliyah, you can call 334-676-7890. One big question going into this week in the legislature is whether we might see a movement on the comprehensive gambling package that was passed by the House two weeks ago. Reports from over the weekend said that some senators are eager to see the bills in committee this week, while some still have major problems with the bills. As a reminder, this gambling package includes a constitutional amendment that would institute a state lottery, expand and regulate casino gambling, and legalize sports betting. Senate leaders say there are lots of conversations going on behind the scenes. Many of our members feel like the time has come for us to try and address it. So then the question is, how do we address it? Uh, the House has been able to, to vote and put out a piece of legislation on how they think is the best way to address it. The Alabama Senate is going to do exactly what we do, what we did today, which is be deliberative, work on the details, figure out what's important to our members, both Republicans and Democrats, and continue to move the process forward. I think you're going to see legislation that's going to be moving in the next couple of weeks related to gaming. I think it will be a topic that is going to be 
different in some ways, as would be expected, uh, than what is passed by the House. And uh, we'll see what the feedback's going to be with that. I'm proud of the members having spent a good bit of time on working on it. Federal dollars will be gone after 26. We're going to be faced with these budgets by ourselves. We're going to need extra money here. Prisons are being overcrowded. It's costing us a lot of money. You're talking about Medicaid, Medicare. It's costing us a lot of money. So we just, we're going to need dollars to be able to continue to help us function in this state. So gaming is a way to do it. I think that they've sent us a bill up here that's something we can work with. And I look forward to the day that we can uh, have a real debate about it. Tomorrow is the 10th legislative day of the 30-day session. The House is scheduled to convene at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and the Senate at 2 o'clock. Coming up next, I'll sit down with House Minority Leader Anthony Daniels to discuss his legislation addressing that IVF issue. After that, I'll be joined by State Senator Clyde Chambliss, who's here to explain the constitutional amendment that's going to be on the March 5th ballot. Those interviews when we come back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Welcome back to Capitol Journal. Joining me next is House Minority Leader, Anthony Daniels. Mr. Leader, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Ty. Well, you've had a busy day because y'all had this press conference, you and some of your House Democratic colleagues, uh, promoting, you've already filed the bill, but um, explaining and promoting this bill that attempts to fix the IVF thing, in vitro fertilization. Ever since that court ruling more than a week ago, um, it's been a, a you know trickling down effect uh, you had UAB said they're going to pause their IVF for fear of being sued. Other clinics in the state, we, we heard from, from some doctors. So you filed legislation. Can you kind of walk us through what it does? First of all, Todd, I will say that I've heard from many families across the state of Alabama that are very concerned. A family that uh, recently got married, uh, they're in their 40s, and they finally have a viable embryo, but and they're scheduled for their appointment on March 11th and they've been called by that fertility uh, clinic and said that your um, appointment has been postponed. Mm -hmm. And so what my bill would do is it will essentially halt in uh, the Supreme Court decision. It will put pause for Supreme Court decision in saying that a fertilized embryo uh, is not a child. Um, and so that's essentially what it does. It doesn't talk about when life begins or ends. Uh, now there are people, there are individuals out there that like to see a CA to finally address this issue. I'm in agreement. I would like to see a CA to address this issue and to amend it, amend the Constitution. But that's not where we are right now. If that can happen, I'm on board with that. But the families that are out there that need to, to be able to have the option to, to have a, a child, uh, being able to go there, going through the process, um, we should not play games with those families that need immediate action Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do a constitutional amendment that may or may not even pass or may not even get the votes that it needs to, to move forward. We have to take care of families right now. And I disagree with those out there that think that um, this issue can't be resolved without a constitutional amendment. I disagree with them. I agree. I, uh, the, the bill, the statute that we pulled was from the actual ruling. And so it was that right. exact language and the ruling was based upon statute. Yeah, and just to <clears> kind of <throat> back up a little bit, because what we're talking about is like a 1980s law, right, about if you, if negligence or something like that causes the death of a child, you have the right to sue. And then that combined with the 2018 personhood amendment, right, meant that the Supreme Court interpreted, interpreted that to mean, well, a frozen embryo that's destroyed through negligence can be considered a child for the purposes of that, that lawsuit law. So, uh, you know, the logic goes if you can tweak that law and kind of the definitions of, then, then, then that's fine, that's enough. But there are those who argue, no, you gotta go further, you gotta enact, you know, or, or ratify a constitutional amendment. But you're, you're in disagreement. You think a, a statute change 
will fix the issue, fix the liability issue for these clinics. I do. I think that, uh, you know, really, really defining what, um, saying that a fertilized embryo uh, is not a, is not a, a child. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you could, uh, if you free, you free, a, a human being being frozen is different than an embryo being frozen, right? And so I think that what we have to come to grips with in, 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 in looking, creating the, a solution to, to this, this very drastic problem, mm -hmm. um, because you, you're, when you're hearing from families, you, you're, you're, you're putting yourself in their shoes. Uh, I had to talk to a lady earlier today at lunch, and she, she wants to know, you know, can I transfer my embryo? Well, you can't. You can't do that right now based upon this ruling. Yeah. But if my bill passes, you can, and you also can resume treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, so I was, yeah, I was talking to Senator Melson about his legislation that he's working on, too. I don't know. I mean, I haven't done a side-by-side -side comparison, but is your bill materially different than his, or are you all kind of on the same page, or what? It appears from the rumors that I'm hearing that they're trying to create a separate category of potential life. Uh, I don't think that creating that category, I think it'll further complicate where we are. Um, and so that can be something they can work on long term. And I'd like to see the other details because I've not seen him introduce the legislation yet. Yeah, I think they uh, were going so late in the Senate that filibuster so he couldn't yeah. get this first reading. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the legislation hadn't been introduced yet. So my legislation, which is why I had to introduce a piece of legislation to try to address this issue, is because the number of calls that you're receiving from families, uh, the number of, of people that that are out there that are impacted by this, uh, other folks coming forward that uh, their families gone, went through this process and they are perfectly healthy today. And so we're just trying to understand uh, how the Supreme Court came up with this interpretation, but let's remedy it right now and then work on some much larger issues, which I, I do agree that there, there should be a constitutional amendment to address some aspects of the law that, was, you know, I think it was 2018, mm -hmm. but this is not, this is not that time. Right now, we have to have immediate action, but if we can if we can get some agreement to get something passed, saying that you want to do something. Right now, Todd, I'm not trying to play politics. I'm not trying to play politics to where if I introduce something and that it has no chance of moving or having any discussion or the details of it is not even being considered, we got to solve yeah. the problem right now. Well, I was going to ask you about that because everything is a little political, right? And I mean, goodness, you're running for Congress, yeah. um, but to, to and, and look at how this has blown up. I mean, it's, it's the biggest story in the country right now. Absolutely. It really is. In the world. Yeah, absolutely, but just because of all the implications. So, you know, like you said, there's a lot of desire, a lot of intent out there to fix the issue and, and get protect these families, protect these clinics. But, you know, you're the leader of the Democrats. The Republicans have a supermajority. Now, you're no stranger to passing, you know, bipartisan legislation, but can... Is it possible for the temperature to get turned down enough to focus and, and people work together on this without it becoming a political football, you know, that people are using to score points, right? I think the mere fact that uh, former President Trump uh, mentioned in his remarks about protecting IVR, uh, IVF uh, could send a signal to Republicans in the state of Alabama that they must address this issue uh, as, as quickly as possible. Now, the details of how to address that issue is something I'm going to be interested in, in really hearing from them. Uh, so far, I think they're looking at my bill uh, just to see, um, you know, is this something that we feel that our caucus or colleagues will on, on, our, on their side of the aisle can, can get behind or no? Mm -hmm. And so they are, everyone is actually looking at the bill that I introduced uh, to see is, is there any way to, ta to add on to some of the things that they're thinking or is it something that they feel is, is goes as far as it needs to go? And w what type of votes will you be able to get out of it? Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, a, in a flip side kind of way, there's actually some p political cover they could have by passing a Democratic bill, right? Because a lot of the criticism nationally is coming from Democrats who are trying to, you know, pounce on Alabama. Alabama it's a pretty easy narrative, right? But they oh, pass yeah. a Democratic bill. They can't criticize you, so or if it's any, even if it's anybody else. So that that can be an, an interesting thing. Yeah, about um, Trump, I saw his statement come out, and it's it's you know we're so used to whenever he has a, would have a tweet, even when he was president, you know, have a tweet or a statement, it would just kind of go off like a bomb, and it, it changes everything. A lot of times for the worse, you know, everybody's got to scramble to figure this out. I think this time it was actually helpful. I think it it gave it, it gives Republicans 
cover if any of them needed that mm -hmm. in terms of you know getting into a complicated issue gives them cover if the leader of their party is actually saying please do this well i think they the the president former president also understands the political implications in november as well right because if this issue is not resolved uh it will be a bloodbath in november yeah i mean yeah it just plays right into that what that, that narrative well look we're out of time but we're going to be following your legislation going forward biggest issue in the country right now and we're sitting right in the middle of it. So, Mr. Leader, thanks again. We'll see you as the week goes on. Thank you, Todd. Always good being with you, bro. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal. Located in the heart of Alabama's aerospace industry, the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville is dedicated to the U.S. space program. The collections span the history of spaceflight from early 20th century rocketry pioneer Robert Goddard to present day. The permanent collection includes the Apollo 16 command module and one of the three remaining Saturn V rockets. Although the center is well known for its historical collections, it is perhaps better known as the home of the original space camp. This world-class educational program began in 1982 as an effort to encourage children to explore careers in mathematics, science, and technology. Space Camp provides children and adults alike with an opportunity to experience what it would be like to be an astronaut. In historical monument to the U.S. space program, the U.S. Space and Rocket Center continues to not only preserve artifacts and archives, but to inspire future exploration and explorers. Welcome back to Capitol Journal. Joining me next is State Senator Clyde Chambliss, Prattville. Senator, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Todd. Absolutely. Well, I wanted to have you on to help explain um, something that's going to be on the ballot here in just over a week. Right. Um, the primary ballot is going to be uh, have a constitutional amendment, Amendment 1, having to do with the legislative process. Mm -hmm. or the voters are, are supposed to being asked to ratify a change in process that y'all use here in the legislature. So kind of kind of complicated, but could you, could you walk us through what it does? Well, this is one of those issues that's truly inside baseball. Uh, before I was here, I had no clue about all this and what the ramifications are. So there's a couple things that maybe you need to have an understanding of before you understand the question. The first one is the Budget Isolation Resolution, BIR is what we call it. That is a constitutional amendment that says we are to deal with the budgets before we deal with legislation, mm -hmm. any legislation. So the Constitution also provides a, uh, an exception, a workaround, if you will. If you have three-fifths of those voting, uh, you can set aside the, the budgets and do whatever legislation that you want. Mm -hmm. We do that routinely all the time. Because it's typically late in the session when the budgets are ready. And there's a good reason for that. Early in the session versus late in the session, we have three more months of data to do our projections. So the later in the session you do your budget projections, the more accurate they're gonna be. So there's a, there's a good reason to do that. So the second thing that you have to understand is local leg legislation and how that works. Local legislation is legislation that applies to a specific county or a specific city. The delegation that represents any part of that county or city has a say in that legislation. If any one of those legislators, House or Senate, objects to that legislation, it's dead. You have to have 100% unanimous support among the local delegation. So these are non-controversial things? Non-controversial issues. If they're controversial, you'll have a split and it will never get this far. Mm -hmm. So putting all of that together, what happens with local legislation, it's just a formality. 
Um, the, the third thing that I wanted to mention that you have to understand is that I, as a legislator in central Alabama, I'm not really worried about, nor am I going to take the time to read, study, and research local legislation from, say, the Northeast or, or any other part of the county, uh, mm. state. So I really don't want to vote on that because I don't know what it is. I don't really need to know what it is. So then you get into this question of three-fifths of what? Three-fifths of the body, three-fifths of the quorum, three-fifths of those voting. And it's been interpreted different ways by a lot of smart people over the years. This amendment would just clear all of that out. You have 100% agreement by your local delegation. It doesn't have to go through the BIR and it, it goes through the legislative process mm -hmm. like any other bill. Now, I wouldn't want to eliminate this on all legislation because that's different. You don't have local courtesy. You don't have that, diff it applies to the whole state. So that is a totally different issue than local legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it was set up as a barrier, the BIR, the Budget Isolation Resolution, set up as a, as a barrier to, to encourage the, the legislature to do the budgets. But as you said, it, there is also an incentive to wait mm -hmm. and all that. So if this passes, um, would you say it just kind of streamlines things for those, those local bills? You don't have to have the three-fifths uh, three vote. You don't have, to, I mean, cause some long votes you know, in the House and Senate, mm -hmm. it would just kind of streamline the, the, the path for those non-controversial local bills? That's correct. The general public would probably never know any difference whatsoever. Um, we just wouldn't have to go through that vote. And, and you know, if you think about taking role in homeroom when we were in school, it takes, you know, three, four, five, six, ten minutes maybe in the House with 140, 105. Uh, so it, it just takes time and we know the result, we know what's gonna happen. So um, my opinion is, is that we just do away with that unnecessary process. So, I mean, it was not a controversial thing in the legislature no. to pass, but mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, you put things on the ballot and just because of the nature of Alabama's constitution, hundreds and hundreds of amendments, longest in right. the world, voters sometimes just vote no reflexively if they don't understand things. So are you concerned at all about that? Well, sure, that's a, a common thought. Uh, I don't know what it means to so just vote no. Um, I, I would say if you look back into, I believe it was in the 40s, there was a constitutional amendment about the legislature calling ourselves into session due to uh, uh, pandemic and there's a co uh, uprising, there's a couple other things. The people of the state voted it down. Hmm. In 2020, that would have been, been really relevant. good legislation. <laughs> yeah, so. interesting. Well, we'll see that and that's why I wanted to have you on because those that are viewing this and we'll, we'll replay this, I want them to have all the information possible so that there isn't that reflex, you know. No well, vote. hopefully the voters will educate themselves and be informed about it and simply just voting no because you haven't had a chance to do that. I, I would suggest if you don't understand it or don't have time to educate yourself just to, to not vote on it. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of constitutional amendments, there is another one that's sort of causing some problems right now for the IVF industry. This has obviously been an all-consuming news story the last couple of days n now that IVF clinics are, have, have paused their operations for fear of being sued. It has to do with that personhood amendment back in 2018. I know you're not heavily involved in this issue, and Senator Melson has the bill, mm -hmm. but I wondered as a caucus, are these conversations starting to happen, and do you expect you know, something to emerge as a legislative fix to this? Uh, we've not had a caucus meeting since the ruling came out, um, and, and I've had family issues over the weekend, so I'm not fully versed on it yet. I have heard buzz uh, among the senators and House members, and I do expect us to have detailed discussions about it in caucus this week. Uh, it is certainly something I, I've, I've got received a lot of emails. Uh, from folks who are in the IVF process and oh no, you know, what's going on? We've invested a lot of time and mm -hmm. money and most importantly, emotional uh, investment in this process. So uh, we're, uh, I'm, I'm confident that we'll work through the issues. Uh, I, again, I don't quite know what they all are yet, but I'm confident that we'll work through the issues and resolve the issue. Yeah, we're gonna be following this really closely going forward and, and you know, we had already talked with uh, Anthony Daniels, who has legislation, Senator Melson has legislation, may see multiple bills, but mm. it's one of those issues that 
gets really personal for folks, sure. as you mentioned, and, and therefore very uh, passionate. Uh, Senator, we're out of time, but I look forward to having you back as we go forward in the session because I know you have other issues uh, to go. But uh, thanks, for, thanks again for coming on the show. Always enjoy it. Thanks, Todd. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Daniel Pratt was Alabama's first major industrialist and founded the present-day city of Prattville as a self-sufficient manufacturing center. His factory complex, the Pratt Gin Company, became the world's largest manufacturer of cotton gins. Pratt was instrumental in Alabama's transformation from a predominantly rural economy to a more diverse industrial economy devoted to manufacturing and the production of coal, iron, and steel. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow night at the same time with more coverage of the Alabama legislature here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.